from basic to fairly advanced in a short period of time. If I completely lose you, let me know. So we'll discuss what genes are, right? how do genes cause disease, what is genetic testing, how are new genes discovered? Something that's relevant to um, here. Can it happen again in the family? And could genetic counseling be helpful? So do we have any Julie Andrews fans? Sound of music? Okay, yeah, I'm dating myself, right? So let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> What's DNA? DNA is a hereditary material. What's a gene? A gene is the basic unit of heredity. So DNA is a very, 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 very long molecule. And a gene is one length along the molecule. Okay? The DNA is all wound up and twisted up. They have some really neat videos on YouTube now. You can look and see how it's twisted around these proteins into structures called chromosomes. But you probably remember that, at least high school, right? Chromosome gene type. Structure that contains the gene. When we talk about the genome, we're talking about all of the genetic information together. And that's in almost every single cell of our body. The instructions for making our bodies. So you may remember that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So again, each chromosome contains many genes along it. Picture of that. Um, so each chromosome has many genes along it, and so because they come in pairs, we have two copies of every gene, right? One copy on this copy of the chromosome, and one copy on this copy of the chromosome. And there's one pair of the chromosomes that determines our sex, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it. So, see this pair of chromosomes here? All right, when we talk about one position on the chromosome, we're talking about a locus, right? and when we're talking about a version of a gene, so which form of the gene, so genes can have different spellings, I'm going to talk about that, um, we talk about an allele. <coughs> this person here has two different alleles of the same gene, or two copies of the same gene. This person has a pink one and a purple one, two different. When they're different, we say heterozygous, hetero is different, or we say the person is a heterozygous. When they're the same, we call it homozygous. Okay. At the same locus. <coughs> and I forgot to mention actually why I'm getting in, into all this terminology. When I was talking to Jennifer about the organization of the conference and what all of you might need to know, she said, Well, what does it mean to have a heterozygous missense to know pathogenic variant? <laughs> So this is what I'm trying to explain to you. So what's, what is DNA? Well, it's a, it's a chemical. It's a biochemical, right? In all the cells of our body, you've heard about the double helix or the twisted ladder. And it turns out that the rungs of the ladder are paired letters. Okay? So it's just that the letters are nucleotides or biochemical subunits. And there are only four of them, A, G, T, and C. So it's like an alphabet, but with only four letters. And the magic about these is that they pair together. They're complementary. So A only ever pairs with T, and G only ever pairs with C. Why is that important? It's important because the DNA can make copies of itself. Okay. So what happens is the, the two backbones, the two strands of the DNA can separate and then you've got the sequence of letters along one strand. And if you have enough other nucleotides floating around in the cell, they can position themselves and pair together and make an exact copy of the strand. And then it happens over and over and over. Why is that important? We all, we all came from one cell, the sperm and an egg together. There was only one genome or one set of DNA there, and it copied itself billions of times as to prove so the DNA is the instructions for all of that to happen. Okay, that's why we all have so many similarities as human beings, and it's why we have a couple differences uh, among us as well. 
So what's the central dogma of genetics? Central dogma, right, as I said, the DNA carries instructions for making proteins. In between, there's, there's like a messenger, something called RNA. So DNA makes RNA, which has the instructions for making proteins. Why are proteins important? Proteins are, are everything in our body, our skin, our hair, our, our organs. They're all made of different forms of proteins. Right? Even the enzymes that carry out the biochemical reactions in the body, they're proteins. Right? Our neurons, our brain, cell, everything. So DNA has instructions for making this mRNA, and there's a special code where three letters, with three nucleotides, codes for one building block of the protein. Okay, amino acids, you might remember from high school. I'm looking for knots. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> I want to make sure you're with me. <laughs> um, so these proteins are made of building blocks of proteins are amino acids, and they're all linked together in a chain, and they, they fold up into this really cool protein, and that's how the proteins are made. And I'm just going to focus in on one aspect of this, the, this arrow. Okay, this how DNA gets formed into the messenger RNA. There's an innate process that happens where only certain sections of the DNA are incorporated into the messenger RNA. So you see here only the yellow parts are incorporated. And the rest of it, the blue, we call those introns, those are spliced out, we call it splicing. They're removed. It's all by cellular machinery we have in <coughs> our bodies. Um, when I was, I'm going to date myself again, but when I was in high school, they told us that the introns are junk DNA. I never believed it for a second. <laughs> I said, it's not junk. If it's in our bodies, there must be some reason. And now we're finding that there actually are some important things that we find in those introns that are spliced out. But I'm not going to go into that today. All right. So, how do genes cause disease? This is a question for the audience. Do, do genes cause disease? It's a trick question. Genes don't cause disease. Genes carry the instructions for making the proteins of our body. Variants in genes cause disease. So, if there's a problem or a, a typo or a misspelling in a gene, the gene may not function correctly and it may actually cause so here's an example, I'm going to give you several examples of types of variants that we can find in the DNA when we do genetics. So here, if this is considered the normal sequence, I say normal in quotes because there are many different normals, um, but here the A in this person is changed to a T. So you can think of that as a typo, we call it a point mutation. But you can have other kinds of typos as well. So if we say, for example, the, the correct version of the gene is the, the chef will bake a chocolate cake. Instead of point mutation might be C is changed to an L, it's a one letter typo. The chef will bake a chocolate lake. Doesn't make sense, right? Or you can have repeats. The, the chef will, 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 will bake a chocolate cake. It's like a broken record from the 1980s. Or you can have an inversion where the word chocolate is flipped around. You can have a SNPs, these are benign um, variations that happen in the population, like a letter missing and it happens really often and it doesn't really matter, we call those SNPs. Um, deletion, so here there's a word missing, if you can notice which word is missing, there's one missing. Um, that could cause a, a disease or a genetic condition. Uh, and then when the deletions are really large, or it might be an insertion of material, we call them copy number variants. And so in the copy number variant, this is not a mistake on the slide, the entire sentence is missing. So you can have multiple genes actually missing in somebody. And I'm, I'm telling you all these just because you may see the, this terminology on your reports. Hopefully it will help you understand. All right, so variant can have a, an effect on the protein structure um, and or the protein function. So examples of an effect on the protein structure are, let me start at the bottom here, we can have something called a nonsense mutation, where a variant in the DNA 
makes it so that the protein is not fully made. Right? As the protein is synthesizing its building blocks, there's a stop signal introduced. And usually those shorter proteins, they actually don't want to break. They're not full length. Um, or, I'm going up to the top now, there may be a variant in the DNA that has no effect whatsoever on the structure of the protein. It's completely silent. Actually, we all have thousands and thousands of those. Um, or there could be a variant on the DNA that just causes like a one letter change in the protein. And we call that a missense. You might see that word on your report. Or a variant in the DNA can have an effect uh, on the function of the protein, how it works. So there may be no effect at all. Let's say baby cake. Those are clear instructions. There might be a person, a variant in that person's DNA. There are many variants we don't have, um, but they're not affecting this at all. And then I'm going to the bottom here. We have a missense variant where the C is changed to an L, big L -L -E. so If you give those instructions to a chef, that's not going to be clear. The chef is not going to know what to be, right? So that interferes, that one letter change interferes with the function of that sentence. Okay. Or in the middle here, you also have a single letter change, B to M, but it actually doesn't change the meaning of the sentence very much. The instructions are maybe still clear, or maybe not. You know, sometimes we don't know how to interpret these variants. Okay. One more set of terminology, and then we'll get on to something more, more interesting. Maybe. So genotype versus phenotype. So it, at each locus or each spot, remember I said we have two copies of each gene. When we describe the actual genetic change, that's called the genotype of the person. When we describe what effect that change has on the body, we're talking about the phenotype. Those are all clinical manifestations. It might be your hair color, your eye color, how wide apart your eyes are, made. And an example of that that's, I think, related to today these two girls, of course the names are changed to protect the innocent, uh, Sally and Maria. So Sally's genotype is written here. You might see something like this on the, the genetic test report, right? So C dot means we're talking about the DNA at position 140 of the CSNK2A1 gene. Sally has an A where most of the population is a G. There's a change from, from this sense variant from G to A. That's her genotype. Okay. Her phenotype is all the problems she's been having, you know, or maybe not problems, maybe just manifestations. So intellectual disability, she has low muscle tone, she had something found on her brain MRI, small head size, that type of thing. Then we take Maria, okay. Her genotype, she also has a variant, but it's a different variant, okay, in the same gene, CSNK2A1 gene. The splice site variant. Remember, I said where those chunks are taken out of the DNA, and that's called splicing. Her variant causes a problem with the splicing. So there might be chunks of DNA in there that shouldn't be, or vice versa. And she's got some similar effects. She's got intellectual disability and low muscle tone, but then she has some differences. So she had a, a normal brain MRI, she has sleep problems, she has scoliosis. So you can see here with the phenotypes with the clinical manifestations that there's some overlap, but then there's some differences as well. And we call this uh, variable expressivity. <coughs> you can have a variant in the same gene, or even the same variant in the same gene, even in the same family, but they have different manifestations. So for example, I used to work in, in cancer genetics. So you could have somebody with, I'm sure you've heard of BRCA, right? So you could have three people in the family with a BRCA mutation, one of them gets breast cancer in their 20s, the other one gets ovarian cancer in their 50s, the other one gets no problem whatsoever. But they can pass in much. But each gene works differently, and we have to learn about and study the characteristics of each gene and how it works. Right. So what is genetic testing? It's analysis of the DNA, but it's not this. Genetic testing looks for variants in the DNA that can cause or explain somebody's condition. When a healthcare provider does genetic testing, they have to decide which test. You know, I work at the GDX, we have over 400 tests available. And 
they could test a single gene, which would mean sequencing through or spell checking through all the thousands of letters in the DNA of that one gene. Or now we have technology to do multiple genes at the same time. Right? Or we could test for a single variant. If you've got a variant already identified in a family, you can test other family members just for that variant. Or on the other extreme, there's whole exome sequencing. And that's looking at the whole genome, which is what? All 20,000 of our genes. So we have the technology now where we can sequence through okay, the exons. Remember I said those regions that are sliced out, so they're like the red sentences here in the encyclopedia, you can sequence through all those exons of the 20,000 genes. And how is this done? I, I'm going here because it, it, the genes <coughs> are all over the media and everyone talks about genetic testing, but you never really see how it's actually done. It's kind of like you send in a blood sample or a cheek swab and then report comes back and you don't know what happened in the, in the black box in between. So I'm going to grossly oversimplify it. It's good that our, our bioinformatics team isn't here because they would probably be insulted that I'm simplifying it so much. But basically what happens is when you send in your DNA, for, or you send in your blood, let's say, for genetic testing, we take out the DNA, we extract the DNA, break it up into many, 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 many random chunks and okay, use enzymes to break it up into these little pieces, stick them onto a like a glass cell. And then, because remember I said DNA can copy itself. So if you put in the right chemicals or the right letters of the alphabet, you've got an alphabet suit in the test tube, it makes many, many copies of, of itself. Okay? And then you can put in nucleotides or the letters that have colored labels. So each time one of them goes on, it emits a colored signal and it tells the computer which letter is going on. So the computer literally reads the sequence. And you've got millions of fragments here. It's just unbelievable technology. And this is what we call next generation sequencing. And some nerdy people at the beginning, they named it massively parallel sequencing. Because they, they saw it. it was so powerful. So, what happens when we sequence through 1,000, 20,000 genes of somebody? Well, we find variants, right? That's what we're looking for. So we get something like this. The red box here, let's say it's, it's a, one little fragment of the you know, normal or the reference sequence. And these are all multiple copies of the same person's DNA. And then the computer has lined them all up together where they fit on the normal. And we notice there's a variation here. All of these are the same, but you see in blue at that spot, it's actually position 3,131 of this gene, the MYH17. Most people have a T, but this person has a C in about half of the reads. So that means that this person has one copy is C and the other copy is T of that gene. So we might say that that person is the word. Or carrier. And so each variant, now remember I said we all have tens of thousands of variants. The overwhelming majority of them don't cause any problem. They just make us who we are. And so those ones we call benign. We have to ignore those, but we have to know enough about them to be able to ignore them. <coughs> On the other extreme, there may be one. That would be like, you know, the needle in the haystack that we're looking for that is causing that person's condition. But each variant has to be classified, it has to be interpreted. And this is where you get, you get very sophisticated computer algorithms, bioinformatic, people with PhDs, and you have human eyes looking at every single report, trying to figure out, is, can we find this needle in the haystack that's causing this find it, that's a positive result, or we call pathogenic or disease causing result. So if we find it, usually that's a good thing because then we found the answer, we found the cause, at least we know what's going on even if we can't treat it. 
And often, we just don't know enough to be able to interpret a variance. And so that's when you might get on your report a variant of uncertainty. It can be a little frustrating because you're, you're like, oh, I paid all this money, I got this really sophisticated genetic testing, and then you're telling me you don't even know what it means. Yeah. So let's go back to the report and see if we understand it now. This is, just the, this is the summary on the first page. So this person okay, had full exome sequencing. And look here, classification, they found a pathogenic variant. What's that? Positive. In this gene, CSNK281 gene. It tells you the specific variant. It's at position 593. Okay. This is the effect. I think they switched. Um, but it tells you the effect on the protein. The person is heterozygous. Okay. And it tells you actually how it's inherited. Does that make a little more sense now? Nods? Okay. Just from the morning. Okay, so these are, I just want to show you the, the different kinds of results you can get. So we talked about a positive result, right? We find that about more than a quarter of the time. Um, then these uncertain results, about 35% of the time. Often we get a negative result, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing important there. It might just mean that we're not scientifically at, at the place that we can find it or understand it or we can put the limitations of the methods or it hasn't been published in the literature, etc. Okay. And then there's a really interesting result you can get called the candidate gene. And that's when there's a variant in the gene that we think might be important, but we're not sure. It hasn't been published, it hasn't been described. There might be something biological, and here's where our, our expert analysts you know, get into, well, maybe the, it's in the same cellular pathway that can cause, cause the, the same problems in other people with other genes. You know, they get into all these analyses, and they say it's of research interest. I think it's good if you're told that you're of research interest. Because it means someone's going to work hard somewhere, that someone's taking an interest in your situation. Some people don't like being told that. So let's go back to the genetic test report. Now, you go through 20,000 genes, and you find something. This is the one we already looked at, pathogenic variant. It doesn't mean you can't find something else. Sometimes you have multiple findings on the report. This person had a variant of unknown significance in addition to positive results. And this is just a sample, so their, their gene is CCCC. Um, but that can happen too. And those, you have to understand, they can be reclassified. So three, four, five years from now, you might find out that we have more information now about this specific variant in this specific gene. And guess what? not important. So then you, the result becomes negative. Or at least you still have the pathogenic variant or this person. Um, but the variant might become unimportant. So if you have uncertain results in your genetic test, it's important to check back periodically and say, hey, do we have any more information about this variant? Now, you might see on the report something about secondary findings. Um, there is the College of Scientists, the American College of Medical genetics and genomics, they've recommended that for 59 genes, we find an important variant in those that we have to tell you as a, as a lab. That you have to be told. The reason they said that is because these genes can cause severe disease, and there are medical ways that the risks can be reduced before the disease happens. So you deserve to know. There is a way to opt out. If you say, I'm, I'm maxed out, I'm, I can't handle any more information, you can opt out of the secondary findings. But you could get, and BRCA is an example of a secondary findings. So a lot of them are cancer syndromes, hereditary cardiac disease, just so you know what they are. All right, so let's move on. How are new genes discovered? I already talked about how a lot of them we don't know yet. We don't know what they do. Each one has to be studied individually. Remember I talked about the, the candidate gene result that you can get of research interest? Those are the ones that might turn into some, something we know about in the future. So that's exactly what happened with CSN k 2 one So what we can do, we have vast internal databases of everyone that we've tested. Our lab has existed since 2000, so 18 years. We 
We've actually done over 100,000 full exomes today. So we can look back at our database and say, well, we found a, a gene of research interest in this person. Who else have we found with that gene? Very. Oh, look, we have four other people who have the same thing. What are their clinical characteristics? And this is where it's important that your, your doctor ordering the test sends in the medical information as well as just blood. Right? We need all this clinical information. And so with the CSN K2A1, uh, well, we did find these people and they did share some medical features in common. So we said, well, maybe this gene is causing those problems. That's kind of a leap. And that's why you need other forms of research that you're going to hear about later today to learn more about that and make sure that we're right. But what we can do, there's, there's a site called Matchmaker Exchange. A lot of groups of scientists have banded together and they said, we can share the genetic information that we find, especially these candidate genes that we don't know much about, and put it online. And then it's like a dating service for geneticists. So you kind of wait. And then you might get an email that somebody in France Found, has a patient with the very same gene, and then you can contact each other and compare and collaborate. And they could contact their patient and ask, do you want to collaborate? And this is where we get into these beautiful collaborations um, with the, the lab who did the genetic testing, the, the physicians and geneticists and genetic counselors and families like yourself, all working together to discover these new genes. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. CSN 8281. This is the original paper in 2016, so it hasn't been very long, right? It led by Dr. Chung and Oker uh, together from, from Columbia, and then a bunch of people from our lab, Megan Cho, Lindsay Henderson, uh, Kyle Redder is the chief of our bioinformatics team, Yang, Jane Dusla is our well, exome supervisor, and then there were people from Johns Hopkins, Boston Children's, uh, McMaster. Canada, who am I forgetting? Oshner in New Orleans. Okay. So a lot of collaborations and the families. And so they published five girls who had variants in Spain and similar medical characteristics. And just as a side note, because I'm really proud of this, um, so our company, has, GGX, has actually done this with 200 genes over the past six reclassified them into disease genes and published them in the literature. And then when we do that, we go back and we notify all the families because we have the database, and now we have more information about it. And so it's impacted over 1,800 patients so far. Okay. Now, let's switch gears. So as a genetic counselor, a question I get a lot is, can it happen again as a family? It happened once. We didn't have any family history. We weren't expecting it. Um, but I'm told it's genetic, they have again. Depends on the gene, right? Depends on the condition. So these are all different patterns of inheritance that exist. Don't have time to go through them all. I'm going to talk about autosomal dominant because that's the one that seems to be operating with the CSIP to one gene. Um, and dominant, it's a rather simple pattern. So it just means that if, if you have one variant, enough to cause the condition. And you don't need two copies like the recessive. Right? You just need one. So in this case, the father has one copy, one normal copy, and one copy with a variant. Each time they have a child, the child might get the normal <coughs> copy or the child might get the copy with a variant. 50-50 chance for each child to inherit the condition. Point. To make things more complicated, though, um, these variants can happen fresh. So we could just start for the first time with that child. And that's why there's no brain history. And this seems to happen a lot with the overtone syndrome. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say always, because I, I do believe we've seen that there's somebody who's, uh, who's affected, who has two, two children who are also affected. If you have it, you can pass it on if you have children. Even if it didn't come from your parents, just start it fresh. Does that make sense? Okay. 
to make things even more complicated, um, these de novo mutations, the new ones, can actually be what we call mosaic. So they could be in some tissues of somebody's body, but not in other tissues of the body. And it depends on when in the stage of development of that variant spontaneously occurred. So from in the cell where the variant occurred, all the tissues that came from that cell will carry the variant. Now this is tricky, right? When we're doing genetic counseling with a family and they say, well, you know, could I pass this on to my children? It's hard because if, if they're a mosaic, the million dollar question is, is the variant in the eggs or the sperm? And we don't really know unless we do a biopsy. Question, would you guys test the sperm or the eggs to see? You can, I mean. If you're going to isolate that and then do, and then do like how the body type. Uh, yeah, egg, eggs are difficult to buy because it's an invasive procedure, so we don't normally do that. Um, but for, the, for, for instance, for the boys in the future, if they're planning their children, is it possible that through a sperm sample, those of us with sons, to determine whether or not they are boys? <coughs> Boys who, if someone's affected clinically, I would assume that they're not mosaic. Okay. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit more about mosaic, and, and I'm actually referring more to the parents. But every family situation is different, and that's where meeting individually with a genetic counselor and a geneticist like Dr. Chung, you know, it's really important to figure out what's your exact situation, maybe different from another family. So how can genetic counseling help? So I, is anyone, has anyone had genetic counseling or care to? <laughs> oh, okay, because often, often people get genetic tests ordered by a doctor, but they never actually saw a genetic expert. So genetic counselors are there, and I think they can still be helpful, even if you've already had the genetic testing done. And there's a website called aboutgeneticcounselors.com. I encourage you to look at it, and there's a nice video. I don't have time to show you, but it really says what genetic counselors do and how they might be helpful. In some ways that, that we can um, is review the test results and their significance. So you're going to bring the report, right, or send it ahead of time. If you have a really good counselor, they might do some preparation before you come in. Um, let them know about the, the article and the publications, and they'll look it up. You, was, you can establish a relationship with the genetics group. So genetic counselors work very closely with geneticists like Dr. Chung. And you know, once they have all, all your medical information in the database, if you go back three or five years later, there may be new developments that they can tell you about, like treatments or you know, answers to your questions, because science has evolved. You can ask the reproductive questions, which I'll get into. One thing that always happens in a genetic counseling session is you have your family tree drawn, we call it a pedigree, and here's an example. So the circles are women, so here we've got Julie, and she's five years old, she's colored in because she's the one who's infected, and the arrow's pointing to her because she's the initial patient who came to attention. And then squares, square, men, I'm not going to say men are squares, I'll say squares are men. Um, circles are women, all right? So you've got the mom and dad here, and then we expand it. So we've added on uncles, we've added aunts, we've added grandmas and grandpas. And I, I've drawn literally thousands of these massive family trees. Um, so the more family history information you can collect before your genetic counseling appointment, the better. And not just focusing on neurodevelopmental, but maybe like here, Aunt, Aunt Jessica had breast cancer at age 42. Genetic counselor might look at that and say, hey, Aunt Jespo needs genetic testing for something totally unrelated. Right? And that might be running in the family too. So it's a good thing to have more hereditary cardiac for the family. So we talked about the parents, but you just go in there and prepare a list of questions. I always recommend bringing a trusted, it says relative or friend, but I recommend a friend. I think if you bring a relative, then they have their own questions about how it relates to them, which could take away from your appointment. So a good friend who can take notes. And because, you know, you get in, your doctors are really smart, so they answer your questions really fast, and they're gone, and then you asking yourself when you got home, what did, what did she say about this? <clears throat> so some questions that come up, as I said, are what are the risks to the family members? The first thing a genetic counselor is going to say is, well, let's, let's do genetic testing. If 
there's any appropriate if it hasn't already been done. And let's start with Julie. She has a development of the intellectual disability. Oh, look, okay. Pathogenic variant. So Julie's got a positive result. So this gives us the answer. We know what's caused the situation. Okay. We talked about then if Julie ever has children, what her risks would be. So each child would have a 50 50 chance of having it. But then let's say mom and dad are interested in having further children. Could that happen again? Well, that's where it gets tricky, right? So we want to test mom and dad to see if they carry it. Even though they don't have any clinical symptoms. So sometimes as you can see down here, it says this individual's mother and father do not carry the variants in the F. So a lot of genetic testing is done with trios, where you've got the child and both parents sending in the samples all together so we can compare the genetics. And that's how we figure out it's de novo where it happened fresh. So if that happens with you, then you've already had, you know, your, you as parents have already been tested and you already know that you're negative, right? The trick happens. So, okay. So if that happens, so if everyone's been tested, parents are negative, child is positive, then the chance of another child having the syndrome is very, very low. I'm not going to say zero. There could still be a variant in the eggs or sperm that we didn't even know about, called germline disease, but it's very rare. So the chance is very, very, very low in that scenario. But if you have a situation where parents haven't been tested, right? sometimes they just do genetic testing on the person themselves, or Parents might have been tested separately using a, a, a different technology, older, older but still used technology called Sanger. <coughs> uh, we don't see mosaicism very well on Sanger, and we see it better on the next generation. So it's better if, as parents, you can be tested for, with next generation sequencing, because there is a chance, and I don't know if this has ever been described with CS19 one so it, this is very cutting edge. This is just something we're finding out about other neurodevelopmental syndromes that we didn't even know before we had this technology. Okay. So even if mom here doesn't have any symptoms or problems, or maybe milder symptoms, maybe she had some learning disabilities in school, but no one really connected that with anything genetic, um, she could actually be mosaic for the variant. So some of her tissues, including her eggs, could actually carry the variant, and that's what went on to, in this case, it's Brianna, right? So why is that important? Because if the mom and dad want to have more children, well, because it's in her eggs, it could happen again in the family. And so it could be a, even as high as 50-50 chance. So is that no longer a the child? Good question. Um, it's so new, we don't even have terminology for it yet. So I would say de novo mutation with a mosaic but yes, it's de novo, but also in the mother. So you're following. Can you check, have you tested the grandparent level to see if it would be at the grandparent level and dormant in the child, the ch next generation? Um, gene, gene variants don't skip a generation. Okay. okay. So you can have, if you have a variant, you can pass it on. Um, but the person may not actually have any symptoms, so they may not know that they have it. And then it gets passed on again to the grandchild, and the grandchild gets symptoms. Remember, we talked about variable expressivity. So it can look like it skips, but it actually, the variance itself doesn't skip. How about siblings? How about sibling? Well, so sibling of an affected person, mm -hmm. it'll depend on the parent's <coughs> status, so, right? So if the parents are truly negative on next generation sequencing, very, very, very low risk because it just happened fresh in that person. Okay. But if one parent is mosaic, if the parent hasn't been tested, we may not know they're mosaic. Right. And again, this is cutting edge. We're just learning about this right now. Um, it's kind of sad because we told all these families that they had low risk for another child and some of them. But again, I, I don't know if it's been described with this particular gene. Yeah, it's a good question. So we're, we're finding it in the blood. 
actually in, in especially the neurodevelopmental syndrome, um, brain malformations, epilepsy. Um, there's some papers, literature I can send you if you're interested. But so far we're just looking at blood and we are finding it in like, it depends on the gene, but up to maybe 8% or 12% for some genes. Uh, people who carry variant in that gene will see it in the blood, but only using next generation. But if you've been tested as a trio with whole exome sequencing, you've already had next generation of the dog. It was done at the same time as the dog. If it wasn't done or it was done separately, you might want to consider just getting it done with next generation sequencing. I can actually do, as of this year, we can do a single variant with next generation. No, so I think that's very similar to the question we had um, before. So you always start at the parents' level, right? The variant doesn't skip the generation. Right? But again, individualized genetic counseling is the best way to go. To get a thorough analysis of your, your results, your family history, your medical history. Draw it all out of the paper, ask all your questions, and then you'll get much better answers than you will from me standing here not knowing you. <laughs> So in summary, what we've covered, a pathogenic variant in a gene can cause or explain a disease. A pathogenic variant in the CSMK2A1 gene specifically can cause overt tongue neuron development syndrome, which has just been described since 2016. Um, CSMK2A1 is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. Mostly it seems to be de novo from what we've seen so far. Parents can be tested, even parents who haven't had any problems can or maybe even should um, be tested using next generation sequencing just to rule out uh, mosaicism to the best that we can. And then consider genetic counseling if you haven't had it already about geneticcounseling.com and consider participation in the research because that's the way that we advance and that's so important. Thank you all for the participation in the research that you've already done and Thank you all for being here, and that's all.